For most of us, if we could just act on what we already know about health, finally change those two or three basic health habits we've been meaning to change, we'd experience a dramatic improvement in overall well-being. But knowing what to do and actually doing it are two very different things. We need an approach that supports true personal health transformation. And this is why I launched a new membership-based health service called ADAPT 180 Health. As a member, you still get answers from licensed functional medicine practitioners and even custom nutrition plans from licensed nutritionists, but it doesn't stop there. You also get your own board-certified health coach, an expert in lasting behavior change. Get the support to truly transform your life and unlock more health, joy, and resilience. Visit adapt180health.com. That's adapt 180health.com to learn more and download our free ebook. Hey everybody, Chris Kresser here. I want to apologize for the audio on this episode with Dr. Cates. Uh, it was great when we started out, but there was an issue that started happening, um, I don't know, maybe a quarter of the way in that we weren't aware of, so we weren't able to rectify that. Um, during the episode. So hopefully it's not too disruptive and this is a, a great show. So I hope you can enjoy it despite the audio quality issues. Hey everybody, Chris Kresser here. Welcome to another episode of Revolution Health Radio. This week I'm excited to welcome Dr. Trevor Cates as my guest. Dr. Cates is author of USA Today and Amazon bestselling book Clean Skin from Within and founder of the Spa Doctor Natural Skincare line. She received her medical degree from National University of Natural Medicine and was the first woman licensed as a naturopathic doctor in the state of California. She currently lives in Park City, Utah, where she helps patients from around the world achieve naturally glowing skin. She's been featured on various TV shows, including The Doctors and Extra TV. Dr. Cates has interviewed over 250 experts on the Spa Doctor podcast and hosted her own PBS special, Younger Skin from Within. She believes the key to healthy skin is inner and outer nourishment with natural and non-toxic ingredients. So I've always been fascinated by the skin. It's the largest organ system in the body. And, and because of that, it's a pretty good reflection of what's going on inside of the body. It's something I'm often discussing uh, with my patients who have skin issues. So I'm looking forward to uh, talking with Dr. Kate about her approach. And I hope you enjoy the episode. Let's dive in. Trevor, it's such a pleasure to have you on the show. I've been looking forward to this. Yes, it's so great to be here with you. So I'm excited to talk about skin. It's always been a fascinating topic to me because the skin, as we know, is the largest organ in the body. And so because of that, it tends to really reflect what's going on inside of the body, which I know is something you've spoken a lot about in your work. Why don't we start there and just go into a little bit more detail about that. You've referred to the skin as our magic mirror. So what do you mean by that? Yeah, well, pretty much you said some of that, what that means, which is our skin is our largest organ. And it's because it's right on the surface of our bodies, it is this outer reflection of overall health. And it can give us great clues about what's happening with our health overall, and also if we're on track with our lifestyle choices. And so I know that people are oftentimes quick to grab a cream or topical steroid or something just to suppress a skin symptom or for women to just use more makeup to cover up blemishes. But I wanna really encourage people to look at your skin as something that's giving you messages, important messages. And you don't need special imaging equipment. You don't need x-rays or CT scans or anything like that to see it. All you need to do is just look in the mirror and it can give you great clues. Oftentimes our skin gives us the early warning signs that something is out of balance. And so when we can catch things early, it's certainly a lot easier, of course, not just to help the skin, but to help our overall health. So when, uh, let's say a patient comes into the clinic and, and they have acne or eczema or psoriasis or some other skin condition, what's going through your head, you know, from a differential diagnosis perspective? Obviously you're gonna look at it differently than a dermatologist might. They're thinking about what, what steroid or cream or, you know, topical thing they might prescribe based on the name of the condition, but you're thinking about it a little bit differently. So what are the, some of the main kind of 
internal imbalances that you might suspect when somebody has a skin issue? Yeah, absolutely. When I'm looking at skin problems, especially chronic skin issues, I want to help try and figure out what can we do both from an internal perspective, but also what can we do on the outside? So it's really both. And I think a lot of times doctors either just use topicals or they'll just also sometimes even as a naturopathic doctor for many years, I was just focusing only on from the inside, mm -hmm. but what we put on the skin is also important too. So it's what I found is that combination approach is what's really key to help with skin problems. And so when we're looking at, um, especially from an inside out perspective, I found that there are six root causes behind skin issues. And when we can find out which of these are, it really does help with addressing whichever skin problem we're dealing with. So there are things like inflammation, microbiome imbalances, blood sugar dysregulation, uh, oxidative damage, and um, hormonal imbalances. So these, obviously, as I'm saying these things, they're not just a skin problem, but they're definitely connected to skin. And so when we can figure out what's going on with these root causes and our skin starts to improve as we're addressing these, we also know that we're helping prevent and possibly even address other health issues with similar root causes. Mm -hmm. And I think what, what's really interesting is, so when I was a kid, I had a lot of health struggles. I had a lot of allergies that showed up on my skin as eczema, hives, mysterious bumps and itchy rashes that would appear. And, and I, I, I'm so grateful that even though it took a little while for us to found, find a holistic approach to help with my skin and my allergies. And I'm so grateful because as a naturopathic physician, I've seen in my practice where people will have something like eczema as a child and they're given topical steroids without really addressing that internal inflammation and some of the other root causes going on. And so then later on in life, then they'll start to develop asthma because again, that the immune system irregulations um, haven't been addressed. And then, and then they're given an inhaler. And so then they go a little bit further down their life. And maybe at that point, then they come see me and they have an autoimmune disease because it, this, the, these underlying causes are just going to keep coming up until we address them. And we can hide them for a little while with a topical cream but until we truly address them, they're just going to show up in our health in some other way. Absolutely. And you know, I think we both agree that's not only the case with skin issues, but so many of the symptoms that conventional medicine is designed, you know, has has medications that suppress, we're often missing opportunities to address deeper issues that if they're not addressed, as you said, can turn into bigger problems down the line. So in your book, Clean Skin from Within, you talk about uh, different skin types. So tell us a little bit about what you mean by that and what those types are. Yeah, so when people think of skin types, they usually think of dry, oily, mature, mm -hmm. sensitive, those types of skin types. But those are really more descriptive. It doesn't really gives a, give us information about what's going on behind the skin problem. So what I decided to do is to redefine skin types. And I came up with some skin personality types and I gave them all human names because we, you know, we like to see our, our patients as people, right? Not just a skin issue or a health issue, right? So they're Amber, Olivia, Sage, Emmett, and Heath. And so these are the, the skin types, but the reason why I, I categorize is, is I was seeing certain patterns in my patients. And while I found there are six root causes behind skin issues, not everybody has all six. So I started to see these patterns. And so that's why I, I gave each one of these skin types, a few of the root causes. So that way, when people identify their skin personality type, it helps them hone in on the root causes behind their skin problems. So I created an online skin quiz. People can take it at theskinquiz.com, theskinquiz.com. 
and they can find out which of these skin personality types they are. And then how do you use those types? Are there, I assume it's, it's a different approach for different types or are, they, are there similar approaches with just some differences based on the types? Yeah, so that definitely with um, my book, Clean Skin from Within, I have a two week program I lead people through. And within that two week program, they can customize their approach depending on their skin type. So mm -hmm. I recommend specific supplements for the for various skin types, even recipes, food recipes, as well as DIY skincare recipes based upon uh, various skin types. And what are those, the, you know, for someone who's pretty keen to, um, to make a big difference or make a change with their skin in a short period of time, um, two weeks is not that long. What are the, what are those four points that kind of underlie that plan? Yeah. You know, when I first started, I'm, I've been a naturopathic doctor for 20 years. When I first started, I, I started doing six week programs for my patients. And I realized six weeks is a long time for people to commit, commit to things. So then I shortened it to four weeks. And then I realized that even with just two weeks, it's enough time for people to see an improvement in their skin yeah. that gives them hope. And so we don't necessarily expect in two weeks, a complete cure, especially for a, a um, a long-term, a lifelong skin issue, but I have seen people completely clear up skin issues in two weeks, but for the most part, at least they want to see an improvement. They know they're going in the right direction, continue the program. So with the two week program, there are four different aspects. There's clean plate, clean slate, clean body and clean mind. So the clean plate are the foods to eat and the foods to avoid. So when we look at these root causes, we want to use food as medicine. And so we want to eat more anti-inflammatory foods, foods rich in antioxidants, those kinds of things, and then avoid the ones that tend to trigger the root causes. And then the clean slate section has more to do with what we're putting on our bodies, on our skin, and ingredients to avoid, as well as healthier alternatives. And when it comes to skincare products, we want to not, we want to reduce toxins in skincare products because that is one of the big sources that we are, where we're exposed to endocrine disruptors and toxic ingredients in our, in our day-to-day -day lives. But we also want to use products that help support the skin microbiome. So that's also a really key important part of this program. And then there's clean body which is about reducing toxins in our environment in other ways, as well as improving the body's detoxification pathways. And as you know, our bodies are so, so wisely designed with these incredible detoxification pathways, and they just need extra support to make sure that they're working optimally. And these, this two week program is a great time to kind of give it a little boost. And the clean mind is the last section and that's about stress management and mindfulness practices, because we know that skin issues are triggered by stress. They also do stress us out too. So then we mm -hmm. get caught in this vicious cycle. So of course, the stress management and mindfulness piece is also a really important part. So what do you think are, are you know, maybe two or three of the biggest offenders from a dietary perspective, and then also from like a, a personal care products perspective. If, if somebody's wondering like, where can I get the biggest return on investment? Like if I had to make just a couple of changes in both of those areas, what would they be in your experience? Yeah, absolutely. So when it comes to, to food, the biggest one is sugar which I'm sure that doesn't surprise you. Um, uh, sugar is, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a problem food for a lot of different reasons. And of course the skin is one of those reasons. And I think for the most part, your audience is not part of that uh, misunderstanding that the only reason why you would need to give up sugar is if you wanna lose weight, right? When I mean, there's way more reason to watch your sugar intake beyond 
um, just trying to maintain a healthy weight. So when it comes to skin, a couple of things to think about with sugar is that first of all, sugar tends to be more pro-inflammatory food. So any kind of inflammatory skin issues, which you know, they generally are, is going to be worsened by, by sugar. And then the other thing is, of course, acne being the most common skin condition, chronic skin issue that people struggle with. Well, when we, people eat sugar and increases their blood sugar, increases insulin and an increase in insulin will trigger excess sebum production, the oils in the skin, as well as excess androgen activity. So then that activity will trigger acne breakouts, especially people that are susceptible to, to acne. And, and then when it comes to the aging process, we know that that sugar because of glycation problems will act, can actually speed up the aging process. So with glycation, glucose binds to proteins in the body. In the case of skin, we're talking about collagen. And collagen, of course, gives our skin that nice texture and firmness. And so when glucose binds to it though, it'll make it more rigid and less elastic. So that leads to more of the wrinkles and sagging skin which, you know, of course, none of us want to look older than we are. And actually, when you look at someone and they look physically older on the outside, they look physically older than their actual age internally, like their joints, and even on a cellular level, that they're just not aging as well as would, would be expected for a healthy person their age. Mm -hmm. And then what about things we might put on our skin, soap, shampoo, other kinds of chemicals. What, what do you think are the biggest, you know, or the most problematic things in, in kind of the industrialized world, let's say? Well, you know, on average, we use nine personal care products a day, which exposes us to about 126 unique ingredients. That was from a study done by the Environmental Working Group. And so 126 unique ingredients, that's a lot of ingredients, especially when you realize that the United States FDA has only banned a, a, like 11 ingredients in personal care products. Whereas in Europe, they've banned over a thousand ingredients in personal care products. Mm -hmm. So that that is left unrated by, uh, by the FDA within the skincare industry. So we, it really is up to the consumer to be careful about what we put on our skin because what we put on our skin doesn't just sit on the outside. I mean, we, we use topical medications as a form of, of, uh, as a route of administration yeah. of medication like hormone. Yeah. And so we know that we get things absorbed into circulation that we put on our skin, but yet so often we mindlessly put products on our skin, the sunscreens, the lotions, deodorants, even shampoo, conditioner for women, makeup galore, you know, all of these things that we put on our bodies, we are absorbing a lot of these. One of the biggest concerns with these is a group of chemicals called endocrine disrupting chemicals. And I'm sure you've talked about this on your podcast. This group of chemicals are known to be hormone disrupting chemicals. Basically they'll bind hormone receptors and mimic hormones or just alter the function of the receptors so that the, our hormones can't function the way that they're designed to. And so endocrine disrupting chemicals have been linked to a number of different health concerns from infertility to weight gain, weight problems, to certain types of cancers, breast cancer, prostate cancer, all just when you think of hormones, anything can go, there's so many things that can go wrong with hormones. And these endocrine disrupting chemicals can really wreak havoc on our endocrine system. So we are exposed to these chemicals in our air and our water, our food, on our personal care products. So we don't have control over all the different ways we're exposed to it just because of living in today's world. But there are certain places where we can reduce our exposure and personal care products are one of those easy places to reduce exposure. So when we look at personal care products, it's often really confusing though, to look at a label and know what's what, 
I mean, when you look at a label and you see vitamin E or argan oil, you're like, okay, that's great. I know it. Yes, but then you get to MLS, and they're all kind of, there can be, even in so, so-called so natural products, there can be a lot of other ingredients we just don't know. And it's really unfortunate because there are, like, for example, there's a group of chemicals used in personal care products, especially a lot of lotions um, called um, formaldehyde releasers formaldehyde releasers. And so it doesn't actually say formaldehyde on the label, but it'll say something like DMDM hydantoin, which nobody really knows what that is unless they're doing a little bit of research into this. And so with these, with these different chemicals, what happens is when you apply them to the skin, they release formaldehyde into the air around you. So, and we know that formaldehyde is a carcinogen we know that it's really toxic when it's inhaled. And so the last thing we want to do is be, you know, surrounded in a bubble of it as we're putting different lotions and things on our skin. And so that's one example. And then we also have things like parabens, which you probably people have heard about. The nice thing with that one is you could see paraben at the end of the word. So you know to avoid those. And a lot of skincare companies have taken those out. But one ingredient that is in so many personal care products, and not just personal care products, but also cleaning products and many other things, is fragrance. And fragrance is listed as a single ingredient, but yet it is a huge whole list of other ingredients that contains endocrine disrupting chemicals. So, like for example, diethyl phthalate is used in fragrance to help the scent last longer, but it is a known endocrine disrupting chemical and it has shown up in human samples. So we really wanna be careful with ingredients like this. Yeah, it's, it's a long list. And I think it's really interesting actually to consider the skin as a barrier system, which it is. And then the gut, uh, with the gut, we, have, we evolved a pretty complex ability to um, keep things out that we, you know, we didn't want to get into our bodies because our ancestors were exposed to toxins through, you know, uh, things that they might eat a lot more than they were exposed to any toxins uh, that might get onto their skin. You know, living in a pretty pristine environment in a kind of, uh, you know, Paleolithic era, for example, they didn't have, there weren't really any, they didn't have sunscreens, they didn't have all these chemicals that they were putting on their skin. So the the skin never evolved that selective barrier kind of quality that the gut did. So um, that's often what I, how I explain it to my, my patients. The skin is just a kind of very open permeable membrane. And pretty much like you said, anything you put on your skin is, is, is going to get in your body. Whereas we have some ability uh, that when we, when we eat something that's not great to, to, to at least keep that out to some extent. Right. No, it's so true. And we have done so much damage to our skin and modern day living to with overzealous hygiene practices mm -hmm. and not just even our own personal care, but also how we clean our homes and all of the different detergents, the antimicrobials that we're using in and around our homes and our bodies, we have done our, we've completely disrupted our own um, micro microbiome of the skin. And so it, it already really varies from one person to the next. I mean, if you, it, when you look at the skin microbiome, it is impacted by people that live in the home with you. So if you live alone versus you live with other people, their hygiene practices impact you with the health of their skin microbiome impacts you. If you have animals in the home, that impacts your skin microbiome. So like you're saying, it's this open system to the outside world and it's impacted by all these different factors around us. So our skin is constantly trying to rebalance itself. And part of that comes from the gut skin connection and the gut microbiome. So when we do things to help support the, the gut microbiome it can definitely help the skin microbiome healing itself, but also 
what we're putting on our skin on the outside and what's around us also definitely impacts the skin microbiome. Yeah, that's that's really fascinating. And it's it's kind of like with the with the gut, of course, we we have antibiotics and NSAIDs and all the other medications that um, have become ubiquitous that people take internally that if, you know really uh, has a negative impact on the gut microbiome and and you're saying the the chemicals that we use and even that people around us are using are having a similar effect on the skin microbiome. Yeah, absolutely. So when you think about all the different antimicrobial agent, agents, like on the obvious is hand sanitizers, right? Mm -hmm. So we're, people are using hand sanitizers like crazy, especially right now to, to kill off viruses and various things they're exposed to, but they're also killing off some of the beneficial bacteria that's living on their skin that's there to help protect their skin. And yeah, our skin has this amazing function and ability to act as a barrier to the outside world, but yet we're constantly doing things to break it down. And so instead we wanna think about ways that we can build up the skin microbiome. And um, so first of all, people um, are kind of a little too quick with the hand sanitizer. Now, hand sanitizers can be very convenient if you don't have a place where you can go wash your hands. So yes, I get that. Um, and using a more of a natural one with some essential oils and aloe is, um, is a nice alternative. But people forget that washing your hands just with regular soap is actually better than using hand sanitizer. And so that just simple things like that, not overdoing it with our hygiene practices is such an important thing. And then when it comes to the skin, a lot of times we're using ingredients and in skincare products that have this sort of occlusive effect. So for example, there's an ingredient called dimethicone and it's used in a lot of lotions and makeups to give that kind of dewy, glowy, hydrated look. But the problem with that, that a kind of occlusive effect that dimethicone has is it's not allowing the skin to sort of breathe. And it's, and, and so our skin doesn't, it's sort of like the heat and microorganisms can get trapped under that layer. And it's particularly concerned if you go outside and you're, you know, you get hot or you're exercising and there's this layer of heat under there and it can actually start to alter the skin microbiome. So even things like you would just think of something as so simple as that can actually start doing some damage as well. So it's not just the antimicrobial agents, but some of these, also these occlusive agents. Yeah, that's fascinating. And it, it's just a, it's a good reminder that there are, you know, one way to think about it is like the modern world, it's not, we're kind of swimming upstream, right? You know, there's, there's, there are a lot of things that we need to be aware of. And I know that can be stressful for people. Sometimes it's just like throw up your hands in the air, you know, oh, oh it's, it's just one more thing to worry about. But we're so far now from what our kind of natural habitat is for, for human beings. And a lot of this stuff has consequences that we're only now just beginning to understand. Like a lot of the, the effects of the chemicals that you mentioned have been studied, but that hasn't necessarily trickled down into the mainstream. And as you pointed out earlier, the regulation of chemicals in the U.S. is just ridiculous. It's basically innocent until proven guilty. <laughs> you know, any company can introduce any chemical into our, you know, into the space and without really proving that it's safe. It's, it's essentially nothing will happen until we, it's proven that it's not safe, which is just an insane way of going about it, I think, especially when you're talking about chemicals that have been shown to not only to, you know, a lot of these chemicals we've been talking about don't just mess with your skin. They also mess with reproductive health and, you know, cause birth defects in some cases and, you know, much more arguably much more serious issues. So there is a, a certain level of vigilance that we, we, like you said before, we have to be our own advocates because the, the, the companies that are manufacturing these things and selling products that contain them certainly are not going to um, advocate for us in that regard. Yeah. 
And that's actually why I, I would started the Spot Doctor skincare line is because my patients just asking me for, for natural products and solutions because they knew about, because I would educate them on, on the endocrine disrupting chemicals, all these different things. I wanted them to avoid these ingredients, but yet they were finding that they weren't liking the results they were getting from the natural skincare products out there. Plus they were concerned. They didn't know who to trust. And so I, I started digging into the research and looking at what are truly natural actions? What are natural ingredients that do help support the skin microbiome? What else helps support the skin microbiome? I started to learn about the pH of the skin and how crucial that is in helping support a healthy skin microbiome. And with that barrier function that that natural barrier function the skin has, part of that is with a mild acidity allows it to do that. So a lot of skincare products actually have a high pH in the products, and that will disrupt that natural mild acidity that helps support the skin microbiome. So when I was starting to look at these different factors, I, and I, I was actually able to find a formulator to help me, I started off making my products in Europe because their standards are so much higher. And I knew um, that the ingredients that I was going to be getting over there and the people that I was working with were going to be in a much higher caliber as far as clean skincare, truly natural skincare. So I started to make my products over there, made sure that all of the formulations were in that mild acidity range, the 4.6 to 5 pH range to help support the skin microbiome. And it, and it really has been rewarding to know that not only can I provide truly natural and clean products for my patients, my customers, myself, my family, my friends, but also products that create difference in the skin. So I started off just really wanting something clean for my patients. And then I realized what was possible when you give your skin the right nutrients, because so many ingredients out there, even if they say they're natural, they're not truly active. And the purity of the ingredients, the quality of the ingredients goes a long way, along with the formulations to actually see visible results on the skin. Yeah, that's so helpful because, you know, over time, I think the, the words natural and organic have become, I wouldn't say meaningless, but <laughs> get, approaching that, right? Like, and that's not just with skincare, it's with foods and as bigger corporations have gotten it you know, seeing that there's money to be made there. Okay, I'm a little bit of a, of a, of a cynic there, I admit. Um, but, you know, you can't just see a label that says natural and organic and just trust that that is, you know, what you see is what you get, right? I mean, with skincare, I know, I, I think that's true as, a, as it is with food. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and a lot of times people don't realize that there's a lack of regulation around terms like natural and um, even the word hypoallergenic, you would think that sounds medical. <laughs> it sounds like something right. that would be regulated. It actually has no regulation around it. It's just a marketing claim, which is so unfortunate and misleading. So it's now, it's now a matter of finding companies that you can trust, that you really believe that they are doing the work. No, I mean, I'm always amazed when we make a new batch of the skincare products and we go through the quality control and um, do all the testing before we get the products out to the public at how many times, I mean, the uh, people involved in the process in the lab will say, do you realize how few manufacturers actually do all the steps that you do? <laughs> and no. I said, well, it doesn't really matter. I'm creating my own standards because I want what's best for my customers. And I, but I know that most companies, especially the big companies out there, they're really just concerned about making money. And it's unfortunate, but we do know it's true. Yeah. Yeah. That's the reality of the situation. And, you know, like I said or, or earlier on, and when organic food was just more coming onto the scene, I think it was 
more trustworthy as a standard. And over time, as bigger companies have entered the space, it's it's gotten in, inevitably diluted. And I think that's also happened with skincare as well. So Trevor, uh, if people want to learn a little bit more um, about your work and about your skincare product line, what how can they do that? Well, my website is thespadoctor.com, T-H-E-S-P-A-D-R.com. And as I mentioned before, I have the skin quiz. So people can go to theskinquiz.com, find out their skin personality type. And um, if people want to get a copy of my book, there's a, a place that they can go and just pay the shipping and handling fee to get it. The book's free. Just pay the shipping and handling fee. And that website is book dot the spot doctor.com so it's book dot t-h-e s-p-a-d-r.com great well thanks so much for coming on the show it's been really fascinating i'm sure the listeners gotten a lot out of it and um yeah i just appreciate you taking the time to do it thank you chris thanks for having me on now we just need to get out there and go ski <laughs> just need some <laughs> more snow that's right that's the champagne problem right but <laughs> it's it's uh it's one of the ways that i know we both love to get out and enjoy nature and be active in a safe way during covid time so i'm I'm grateful to have that opportunity yeah absolutely all right thanks, okay thanks everyone for listening keep sending your questions in to chriscrasser.com slash podcast questions and we'll talk to you next time and that's the end of this episode of revolution health radio if you appreciate the show and want to help me create a healthier and happier world please head over to iTunes and leave us a review. They really do make a difference. If you'd like to ask a question for me to answer on a future episode, you can do that at chriscresser.com slash podcast question. You can also leave a suggestion for someone you'd like me to interview there. If you're on social media, you can follow me at twitter.com slash chriscresser or facebook.com slash chriscresserlac. I post a lot of articles and research that I do throughout the week there that never makes it to the blog or podcast, so it's a great way to stay abreast of the latest developments. Thanks so much for listening. Talk to you next time.